what types of provincial supports are needed to ensure that our creative economies uh, can continue to flourish? Maybe we'll start with Regan. I would love, thank you. I, I think it's fair to say that um, creatives, artists of different disciplines and organizations that, um, you know, we are the creative artists. We are the ones, we are the practitioners of art. We are the creators of art. And it's always been historically and modern that arts and culture is a very niche sector of our economy. And uh, having said that, I think it's very imperative now that all of us as creatives are called on to really think how we're going to innovate on our projects and find new ways to um, create and produce our work and to have the supports in place from our um, government in, in, as far as having the time allowance I think in order to um, you know figure all of that out is important do you know I mean we're, we're all pivoting and um, you know art uh, creating art takes time there's a lot of work that goes on behind the curtain. There's a lot of work that goes on behind stages and rehearsals and things like that. And if we, if that time is, if that downtime is without any economic support, then it really impacts creatives ability to create, right? We are wanting to have, you know, some kind of stabilization to, to enter into that human imagination and the human skill of expression in various disciplines. So I think, I, I don't know what that looks like, but I hope that something will come that, um, you know, in, in the downtime of making this pivot and creating new innovative projects that we're, we do find support for those things. Um, and also I wanted to mention what I did think was a good thing that came out of this and I don't know yet uh, again, maybe, forgive me, maybe our, um, our Sarah and Jill, you could maybe school me on, on this, but I will say this prior to COVID there was really no um, uh, sort of allowance of consideration toward the gig economy. Right? It wasn't part of the consideration. And so now having having hit with COVID and this there's like a revelation that's taken place that's oh my goodness, we have X amount of um, dollars that's generated from the gig economy, oftentimes by creative artists in different disciplines. And now um, I think, you know, I hope post COVID there'll be room for this to um, be part of the the equation forever and ever because this is part of, you know, this is part of the creative economy and the cultural industry overall. So that recognition point I, I see as a bit of a silver lining. Uh, I hope that's, I hope that stays, you know, and it includes in the, the NOC code, you know, our national occupational classification code has to include those of us that work in the gig economy. So that's all. I think for, for me, um, when we're talking about like where we go and post COVID recovery, I think that it's important, Jill was mentioning this, um, but it's important to recognize that during this time, artists have been the ones holding us up. They've been reading their work, they've been performing a lot of times for free. And so, you know, all the support that will come is actually not a gift or a freebie. It's actually fair compensation for the free work that's being provided right now. So I think that's really important because it shifts the mentality. And one of the things that uh, all government provincial leaders and, and national leaders have to understand is the value of artists and the value of art. And I think this season has showed us the importance of art, the importance of artists and holding us up when we have nothing. We can go on Facebook and we can read our books. We can sing. I can't, but other people can. Uh, we can perform. And these are the things that have actually literally helped us, held us up. And I say the same as, a, as an athlete as well. My son, like the sports, those types of things have held us up, have kept us going, have kept us physically strong, mentally strong during this time. So that compensation for arts is, is what we're looking for, I think, in the upcoming year. For me, I found this year we had already received our funding for the year. And there was also a lot of COVID relief that was provided. So if you didn't sell tickets, for example, um, there were uh, Ontario Arts Council and Canada Arts Council opportunities that sort of fulfilled what you might have missed. Even our municipal government did that as well. Um, but one of my concerns is about next year and about what happens when they're drawing lines and creating budgets 
where things fall and instead of having grants that you just use for online funding or online events, you're suddenly going to be asking for money that maybe isn't there. And so just making sure we understand the value of artists and that we, we assign money there first or amongst the top considerations rather than last where it, norm, where it often is considered, um, I think is really important. Um, I also think uh, it's really important to have flexibility in grants. I think that's another thing that's really needed that hasn't been there before. There's a lot of people who receive funding and or request funding based on just sort of the same thing all the time or the expectation that you get the same amount of money but you argue about how you're going to do more. And so I think that the funding models have to shift to allow for innovation, to allow for uh, new opportunities, to transition your festival into a new forum or format or to create the framework. Because the reality is what COVID's taught us is, hey, this could happen again. We, it could be COVID, it could be something else. And so our ability to adapt is going to be really important. And if all organizations can sort of build the capacity to adapt, by having innovations, by having training and information and support. I think that's uh, a really important uh, thing to do. One of the things that's really helpful too, I'm a part of an organization in Scotland um, called uh, Momentum. I'm a delegate for Canada this past year. They do a lot of like inter-arts training. So they bring artists in an industry from around the world together to help train up a new sector of artists to sort of you utilize each other's skills. And so one of the things I think we can do too going forward post COVID is the government can actually assign funding to help train and support people in innovating, right? So how do you, how do you digitally maneuver? How do you create a festival that is both accessible and also takes into account any new procedures that are required for COVID-19 in 2021? Um, and so training artists, like somebody like myself or anyone in my organization or somewhere else, creating that support where they're funding an organization by allowing them to share their knowledge, right? So you're utilizing artists, you're utilizing skills and also supporting them at the same time. Those kinds of innovations where you're thinking about the value of arts and how to spread that value out, how to make sure everybody has knowledge, information, support by funding the people who are already doing it. So that kind of thing for me is where I think the best bang for your buck comes out of something like this. How do we turn the year around or how do we go into 2021 and elevate the people who were successful through 2020 in a way that also benefits everyone else we want to be successful in 2021 and going forward? Um, yeah, I complete. Thank you so much, Jail, for uh, you know uh, pointing all that out. I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with that, especially being an independent artist. I mean, like I'm a singer, and uh, but I do not have, for instance, uh, you know, a soundproof room in my house from where I can perform live or on Zoom or you know. And when I when it comes to community engaged arts, I work with seniors in Scarborough, for instance. Most of them don't even have access to the internet. So how are we to reach them? And now more than ever, when they are in isolation, they need to be supported. And yet we are not able to do that. I mean, so it's not just enough to have the art in your hands. It's also about being able to make, uh, to ensure that everyone has access to it. And for me, for me, you know, like uh, uh, when, uh, when people ask me, what is it that I miss about uh, performing? For me, it is simply being able to create something in which you have to be there. You know, when I say there, I don't mean, the, I guess, virtual. It's, it's, it has to be part of anything that we do going forward. But, you know, the live performance cannot die. It should not be allowed to die. And so I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is that, uh, especially for small theaters, you know, smaller organizations, maybe the government can offer tax subsidies, you know, because uh, uh, definitely when, if, uh, when theaters open, I'm saying when and not if, when theaters open, it cannot be, you know, like uh, it's probably going to be at a capacity of 50 people or at best 100 people. So there's a, a revenue, you know, there's income loss out there. So, you know, the tax, uh, the government can give tax subsidies and to incentivize the audience to go to the theaters, maybe they can be offered tax credits. 
you know, and because I keep telling myself that, uh, you know, art is important. It, I mean, if the light, if the pandemic is crushing our soul, art is what elevates that soul. And I would hate, I for one would hate for it to stop. That's it I have to say. I wanted to add one thing to that that I forgot to mention. The other thing that I think will be really important coming out of this is some regulations around supporting Canadian artists and if in Ontario, Ontario arts. If we're going to open and there's going to be limited amount of numbers in terms of like, you know, I mean, Christina will talk about she had to cancel like 20 shows, probably more than that. But just to example, 20 shows. When bringing it back, I think we have to prioritize um, Ontario creators and Canadian creators, I think we also have to prioritize racialized creators as well and start to 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 really focus on um, not just opening the doors and allowing art to come out, but who needs the funding? Who do we need to support and elevate when we're doing that? Chapters Indigo, for example, bookstore filled with American books, <laughs> you know, and in the radio industry, there's regulations on Canadian music. You have to play a certain amount of Canadian music. I love to see regulations that say, you know, inside Canadian stores, Canadian art and Canadian artists need to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. And I think this government also needs to bring back the, uh, the professional development funding that was drastically cut. You know, there were so many amazing, amazing programs that the Ontario Arts Council had to offer, which are no longer accessible to an individual artist. Individual artists have been most affected. Can I follow you, Sharda? I, yes. Yeah, I, I just, um, I support so strongly what you have, both of you have just said, and I will just add to keep it, keep it rolling. I feel like um, we need to have investment in arts leaders and we need to find new ways of funding where we invest in people with a proven track record, not all, everything doesn't always have to be project based. People need that flexibility. They know what they need to do. They know how to shift with the times and if we really are serious in investing in people we can be we can be doing that i think we have to really acknowledge the lack of pension and benefits that artists operate under and and deal with it and start to provide things i think we have to acknowledge like just the income disparity and just the, the how un, artists are just so underpaid um, Hill Strategies released a report, a revised report in January about the income of artists across Canada. Uh, 24,000 is the average income of a professional artist in Canada. For Black and Indigenous artists, it's 16 to $18,000 a year. Um, art cultural workers and arts leaders are averaging $36,000 a year. So I would suggest that, you know, arts funders who are giving operating grants to organizations should take the leadership of creating a base salary amount. You know, maybe there's a certain amount of money, which is a living standard, you know, um, and that arts, organize, arts funders can set that standard and say, our operating grants will not fall below this amount because we know you might only have one arts leader or maybe two staff or one staff and that person should have like a certain level of a salary to live on raise a family have a retirement fund and be able to do that because the arts um people don't go into the arts to get rich uh very often and <laughs> so, i'm not gonna get rich christina what <laughs> <laughs> oh so sorry you will you will so there's one other point I'd like to make, which is, you know, in the way we live in our society, we're always brought back to the present moment. And there's so many things that try to keep us in the here and now, but we have to have that long view to the future. And I think this pandemic really showed me that um, the things that we're worried about, the things I'm worried about, like climate change and global warming, uh, growing income inequality, the rise in the brazenness of hate groups. Like, those are the things I'm worried about. I didn't have this idea of a pandemic on my radar at, our, at all. But we have to think ahead to those things, at least that we know are the dangers. And what keeps us human in the middle of all those things, to me, is the arts and this really important work that artists and organizations do to give us hope, give us connection, soothe our mental health to take away anxiety and worry because we, they actually let us engage with the issues and process them together often 
So I, I hope that in the long term, we, we recognize and see the value that artists play in our society um, and that we can you know, set up systems to stabilize artists' lives and incomes so that they can do that work. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I want to thank fair each fair. of you for sharing, um, you know, such important perspectives as we think of that way forward. Um, you know, I think while this pandemic has happened and, you know, it's been uh, quite some months that we've been kind of navigating what this looks like, there has been a silver lining, which is this collective consciousness that has been uh, sort of created amongst us all. And I think you're absolutely all correct in identifying art as a uh, sort of tool that has uh, brought us together, that thread that is, is connected us and I think more now than ever we do need to think of ways to innovate and you've all shared uh, some very interesting uh, suggestions on on the way forward and I think uh, the underlying point that that all that each of you sort of you know highlighted was that we need to value art and we need to value culture and we need to ensure that the industry is respected and people are fairly compensated whether we're going through a pandemic or not. Um, and I hope that the way forward uh, really takes that into consideration and that, uh, you know, that our creative sector is properly supported and that we are looking out for, um, you know, um, what or traditionally marginalized groups who have been excluded, um, you know, collectives, grassroots organizations who are really leading the charge on, on creating uh, our, our local arts and culture communities.